Hello and welcome to the Comlex 5 minute review. Please visit comlexflashcards.com for more Comlex prep resources and good luck in your board exam preparation. Today's topic is dilated cardiomyopathy. This is the most common type of cardiomyopathy and the pathophysiology involves dilation and hypertrophy of the four chambers. A key question here is, is it systolic or diastolic? Well, this type is systolic dysfunction and mainly due to poor contractility. And it has a bad prognosis. Again, the etiologies are coronary artery disease with prior MI, alcohol abuse, drugs such as doxorubicin or adriamycin. These are commonly asked on boards. Infectious causes, Coxsackie B virus, Chagas disease, again, very high yield, and Lyme's disease and HIV. Metabolic causes like beriberi, uremia, genetic storage diseases, um, other thyroid diseases as well as pregnancy are all risk factors for dilated cardiomyopathy and so is systemic lupus and scleroderma. Most of the cases however are idiopathic. So to make the diagnosis you have to look for signs of left and right heart failure. You look for arrhythmias, S3, S4, AV valve insufficiencies, EKGs, um, and echo is the definitive test for making the diagnosis. Okay, On the chest x-ray, you'll see consistent signs with of heart failure. As you can see in this chest x-ray, the heart is enlarged. The treatment involves diuretics, digoxin, beta blockers, and possible heart transplantation. You want to discontinue the offending agent, whether it's the medications or alcohol, and also address the main cause of the dilated cardiomyopathy. Also, you want to anticoagulate the patients to um, you know, prevent any risk of embolization. And consider an ICD, VTAC or VFib is seen on an EKG. Now, what about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? Well, this is an autosomal dominant condition due to a mutation in one of the genes. And what happens here is that the cardiac myocytes are in disarray. Unlike the dilated cardiomyopathy, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is diastolic dysfunction, and this is mainly due to poor left ventricular dial relaxation. Okay, so with dilated cardiomyopathy, the chambers were enlarged, leading to a systolic dysfunction. With diastolic dysfunction and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the poor left ventricle cannot relax. Okay. Um, there's also dynamic outflow obstruction with asymptomatic hypertrophy of the interreticular septum. And so that's the pathophysiology here. As you can see in this diagram, the interreticular septum is hypertrophied. Okay. Now, what are the signs and symptoms? Um, you know, the usual signs of syncope, dipsy on exertion, angina, palpitations, arrhythmias, sudden cardiac death, loud S4, strong apical impulse, systolic ejection murmur. Again, you don't have a click here because the valve is not involved. Um, murmur decreases with increased preload or afterload, and it's decreased contractility, increases with valsalva and standing. Here is a board exam point uh, that you should remember. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy increases with valsalva and standing. Okay. To make the diagnosis, there's several things you'd want to look for. Again, definitive is echo. Um, you can do a myocardial biopsy um, for diagnosing it, but the first test you would get is the echo, and also family history would help you. Um, and here's a picture of the echo showing the hypertrophy septum. What about the treatment? Well, here what you're trying to do is avoid any kind of excessive strenuous exercise. Uh, because the left ventricle is having problem with the relaxation. What you do want to use is beta blockers, calcium channel blockers if the patient's symptomatic. Um, in some cases, myomectomy has been, um, you know, received high success rates. Um, also, an ICD may help prevent any abnormal arrhythmias. Um, and what you want to remember is that, you know, using these um, medications, such as the beta blockers and the calcium channel blockers, is going to help the heart, um, especially the left ventricle, with relaxation. Okay. Now let's talk about restrictive cardiomyopathy. Well, this is again a diastolic dysfunction due to the ventricular compliance that has decreased. The systolic dysfunction in advanced disease is also present because of impaired contractility. 
So initially you have a diastolic dysfunction for acute cases, but chronically it can progress to a systolic dysfunction. You want to remember the pathophysiology here. It's due to decreased ventricular compliance and eventually leading to impaired myocyte contractility. Here's a key point. What is the etiology of restrictive cardiomyopathy? And so when you're answering board questions, if you have a patient with amyloid, sarcoid, hemochromatosis, scleroderma, carcinoid, again, amyloid, sarcoid, hemochromatosis, scleroderma, carcinoid. One more time, amyloidosis, sarcoidosis, hemochromatosis, scleroderma, and carcinoid syndrome, or idiopathic causes. You want to think of restrictive cardiomyopathy, okay? To make the diagnosis, you get the echo with the thickened myocardium. Um, you also see an increased right atrium, left atrium with normal left ventricle, okay? So here the left ventricle is going to be normal. Um, again, there's bright sparkled myocardium in amyloidosis and you, um, you can get a biopsy if needed, but this can also mimic constrictive pericarditis, okay? Um, and here's a diagram um, showing you the different types of myopathies. You can see here this is the normal heart, okay? With dilated cardiomyopathy, all four chambers are enlarged, all right? With hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you have the septum that's excessively enlarged. And with the restrictive type, we see here, um, you can see the deposits of amyloid, okay, and the compliance issues that are going on with the restrictive cardiomyopathy. The treatment is first treat the underlying disorder. If the patient has hemochromatosis, sarcoidosis, amyloidosis, then you want to address that. Um, digoxin if the systolic you know, function is present, okay? So in all, you know, we talked about using digoxin in dilated cardiomyopathy. You can also use it for restrictive cardiomyopathy. And um, keep in mind that, you know, there's more lectures, more resources on complexflashcards.com. We have daily posts um, including rapid review facts and quick hits to give you the most of your time. You should start reviewing these during your first years of medical school as you get closer to the board exam. And again, please subscribe to our blog and visit us at complexflashcards.com and good luck in your preparation.